Welcome to episode 35 of the Serious About Security podcast for April 15th, 2013, also known as Tax Day in the United States. Um, this is, episode is, as usual, brought to you by the Center for Education and Research and Information Assurance and Security, or Sirius, at Purdue University. Uh, today I'm joined by Mike Hill, Keith Watson, and Josh Gillum uh, via chat. Um, I'm Preston Wiley, and uh, today we'll start with Mike, who has the first article. Thank you, Preston. Um, the first article today discusses the uh, Apple iMessage. Um, an article came out in the last couple of weeks that described how the feds, the uh, DEA, could not intercept messages sent uh, via iMessage between two uh, iOS devices. Uh, they claim that the uh, due to the encryption, uh, the communications could not be intercepted uh, regardless of who the cell phone service provider was. So whether you had uh, AT&T, Verizon, or there's some other ones out there now like T-Mobile, uh, they could not intercept these messages. However, some follow-up articles came about uh, shortly thereafter that were uh, critical of this claim. Uh, they say that uh, this can easily be uh, defeated if you've ever upgraded your iPhone in that when you get a new iPhone and you're transferring data over all of your messages show up magically uh, so therefore Apple must be storing these messages um, and Apple has to hold the key to those messages uh, so therefore if uh, the government approached them and asked for that data they would need to turn it over uh, so uh, there's been some speculation as far as why uh, this information would be uh, released. And in fact, it was, you know, the, uh, the DEA didn't just come out and say this. It was from a leaked document that revealed that uh, it was difficult to intercept these messages. Uh, so um, I guess you'd say some conspiracy theorists or, or whatnot are saying uh, that this is probably not an accidental leak of a document, that there was probably some... A reason uh, for, for them to make this claim and that um, you know in some cases they may be trying to lure uh, iPhone user you know criminals who use iPhones to into uh, maybe using them uh, more carelessly you know saying oh well I'll, I'll send you this really sensitive top secret information through iMessage because the the feds they can't uh, they can't intercept this and can't understand what we're saying to each other and it can't be uh, can't be used against us um, so I thought this would be an interesting thing to discuss um, you know I, I will point out that it was noted that Apple's privacy policy uh, authorizes the company to divulge customers information about customers to law enforcement when reasonably necessary or appropriate or to comply with the legal process uh, so my take on that is if, if they're presented with a warrant, uh, they're going to be able to see what messages have been sent out um, via my iPhone, um, regardless of whether I was using iMessages with encryption or just standard SMS messages. Uh, so what do you guys think? Um, I think that this is one of those cases where it could go two ways. One is that the government is really clueless, which frequently they are or this could be a, a bit of as you said uh, disinformation to try to encourage people to use a technology that they know to be easily broken either through technology means or through the ability to just knock on Apple's door and say excuse me Mr. Apple can you provide me with the content of this user's uh, iMessages um, so it could go either way here it's not clear I mean if it is a disinformation campaign it's it if with you know with a leaked document it could be uh, pretty impressive if that's the case well I think it may also be a combination of the two um, I think traditionally with SMS messages they can place an intercept within the cellular network or whatever and capture these messages real time while with iMessage instead of going through the carrier like SMS messages do, they go through Apple. And so unlike the traditional SMS messages that I'm sure they're used to capturing, this is a different this would be a different process and a different procedure for getting these messages. And so it's, you know, and something that's different or new is can be confusing to the uh, feds or the police um, because they haven't they don't know exactly how it works yet. And so this may just be them not quite knowing 
how to handle this at the moment. And, and that could be true because if you, you may recall a law known as CALEA, and that is the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act, and this uh, came out, uh, was passed in 94, and required that telecommunication companies have a duty to cooperate in the interception of communications for law enforcement purposes, okay? And one of the requirements was that telecom providers made changes to their equipment so they could quickly tap any phone conversations carried out over its networks and making call record details available. Uh, obviously with iMessage you're dealing with with Apple and since it's an end-to-end -end encryption system yet they have some control over the messages because they store them and you can also recover them that they certainly have the ability to capture these messages but they're not a telecommunication company so the ease at which the government can get access to information from a telecommunication company does not apply because I believe Calia is specific to just telecommunication providers. Right, and in some cases when law enforcement wants to essentially look at people messaging, it's, you know, they need immediate, they need the immediate messages. And with Apple, they can get an archive of the messages it sounds like if they have a warrant or they have some some or Apple agrees that legal that they should have access to them according to their terms of service um, but they really don't have any way of getting essentially a, 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 a log of the messages without a court order um, to do that yeah um, so it sounds like if it's something that's real time and sensitive to real time, you're probably better off with the iPhone messaging using iMessage. But if it's something that's being built up over time to use in you and to use against you in court, uh, that iMessage may actually work against you uh, because something I read basically said, you know, Apple could turn over all those messages going back a very long time. It was a little, you know, Apple doesn't say a whole lot about iMessages, so it's a little unclear as far as how much they keep, uh, but it's not unreasonable to think they might have a whole history of your iMessages. I mean, it's definitely plausible that they would have that going all the way back. Uh, whereas SMS messages, um, seem to have a much shorter lifespan. Um, but again, in real time, they'd get you kind of immediately because they could intercept those messages. But if they're building up a, a big uh, legal case against you, they might, uh, they might be able to gather more information if you are using iMessage. I think it's completely possible that, that Apple does store quite a bit, if not everything, because they, I seem to recall they have a huge data center in North Carolina, just the right sort of place where you might want to store a lot of information. Just a thought. And I'm fairly certain that cell phone providers do not store every single SMS messages that goes across their system as well. I think they store them for a, a particular period of time. I seem to recall reading something about messages being stored for a, a certain amount of time for each carrier. I'd have to look to see if I could find that again. But that was kind of interesting. Some of them stored stored it for 18 months, some of them stored it for six months, and then they purged it after a while. Okay, well I guess we'll, uh, we'll see uh, the future of, uh, of this, if anything comes out of it, but I think we've probably heard the last of what we're going to hear about iMessage for a while, unless something, unless Apple makes a statement, which I don't think they will, or the government makes a statement, which I don't think they will. Yeah, I yeah. believe the article said they both declined comments on the uh, leaked document. <laughs> I think, yeah, it, it's typical of what we would see, uh, in you know, just given different companies as well. They're they're less willing to talk about those sorts of issues, unless there's a big public outroar, uh, you know, out, out, uproar about what they're doing with their data. Uh, but Apple fan base uh, seems, and I would say customers, but it's really more fan base, uh, they don't typically care as long as they get good stuff out of their phones. No offense, Mike. None taken. <laughs> <laughs> it is a good phone, I will say. I'll put a little plug in. <laughs> 
Well, we can move on to the next series of articles, and this is related to Mozilla. Uh, last week they announced the second beta of Mozilla Persona, which is an identity system for the web. And as we have talked about many times in this podcast before, we have an issue uh, with a lot of users. For every web service they want to use, they have a unique username and password that they have to use for each site. Every time they want to use something new, sometimes they got to create another account. And we've always recommended that people store that information in a, you know, a secure password managing system, system such as 1Password or LastPass or one of the others whose name escapes me at the moment. Um, but Mozilla is trying to tackle this from a different way. And so their approach is to kind of make sure that each user has control over their information but accessible through their web browser. And the kind of the opposite approach to this might be considered OpenID, which was a standards-based system where you would use an identity to access a variety of websites and you had a unique identifier uh, for your use. And so you would sign into your OpenID provider, and then that provider would provide the credentials you needed to sign into your websites. And I think the problem here is Mozilla is going to run into similar issues as OpenID did. Mozilla Persona attempts to solve a, a simple, uh, uh, not simple, but a, a different problem that OpenID does not, and that is privacy. Because their method uses information stored in your in your web browser to do the credential exchange, whereas OpenID you had to rely on a third party and you had to trust that third party. And that third party could also track what sites you logged into because whatever site you wanted to talk to had to talk back to the, th the third party identity provider. And this method uh, claims to not have to do that. And so they've issued their second beta, and they're trying to encourage more websites to sign up and start using this. Currently, there aren't too many. Uh, one thing they did do is provide a bridging service. So you could take a, uh, say, a webmail provider, somebody with uh, a large number of accounts, and integrate the Mozilla Persona system into that so that those users could start using it right away. And so I thought this is interesting from the point of view that it tries to tackle the, the, the problem with having multiple web accounts, and this is just another solution to that. Uh, it remains to be seen how well this works, obviously, uh, but they do have a beta out. They have all the source code available so people can review it. So I thought we'd talk a little bit about this today. Well, I did test it out right before this podcast. Um, and the one thing that kind of disappointed me uh, is the lack of any sort of two-factor authentication in the system, which I think is something that's that's important and <clears throat> is kind of ever, people are adding it on. I mean, Apple added a a two what what do they call it a two meth step authentication process even, and uh, Google has it, and Facebook has something. And I think it's it's something that's noticeably lacking from this uh, this system. And uh, in the second beta, you know, is it, is, I don't think it'll be out before they get out of beta with it. And I'm kind of disappointed that it didn't start out with a with a two factor uh, authentication approach to it. Yeah, that tends to uh, drive it down a little bit, I think, Preston. Um, I think those who are interested in security will want that, that second factor authentication. Um, I think it's a, a really great idea, however, and, and maybe they'll bring that along. Uh, the, the one piece I see here that's going to make it really difficult is how many sites actually will end up adopting uh, persona support. Um, as Keith mentioned, not too many sites give you the ability to log in using it yet. And that's gonna—I think—that's gonna be the make or break for it. If sites don't incorporate it, 
you're not going to really be able to take advantage of it. So they're going to need those major sites that, you know, those really popular sites that people visit to, to support it. And, you know, I don't know, unless it really catches on, I can't see the big sites, um, you know, like Google and um, Facebook necessarily adding that support right up front because they have their own authentications that they're encouraging people to use. Um, so they probably won't be the early adopters of it. So I think that's going to be the challenging part for them. And, and I think you hit on a, a key point there. If you look at the Facebook and Google approach to uh, using their identities to log into other sites, part of that is they want to see where you go. Facebook would re really love to see what sites you go on. If you use the Facebook comment system on another third-party site, they're going to want to see all that. With the Mozilla Persona system, they lose out on seeing that information. So I really don't see Facebook adopting this at all. I really don't see Google adopting it, although they're more likely than Facebook, perhaps, to do that. But that's a big problem because you have a lot of sites where, you know, log in with your Twitter ID, log in with your Facebook ID, log in with your Google ID. Those sites will then lose out on any information um, from getting, you know, grabbing data from the profile of the user or a list of their friends or that sort of thing. They'll lose out on that and the provider, Facebook, Google, Twitter, whoever else, they're going to lose out on seeing where this person has been, what they like, you know, what their comments have been on these third-party sites too. And so there's less incentive for them to sign up because that kind of breaks their business model. And we know how a lot of businesses don't like to change their business model. Um, I don't think this is one where we're going to see them jump on board either. But, you know, if you go back and look at OpenID, they had similar problems, right? Even OpenID, which, you know, minus the trusted third-party approach, still had issues because of its adoption, and it's still not widely adopted anywhere. Yeah, I mean, that'll be the key is... Um, whether or not anyone will really take off in adopting it. And, and that's, you know, like I said, unless they can really get some major sites behind them. Um, I, I'm assuming that um, just because of the integration they already have with the Yahoo, with the identity bridge, that Yahoo might be one of those sites, but um, I, it's not as big a player anymore as those other sites. So, I mean, they, I think they really need to get some wide adoption. And that's a... No, that's a hard thing. Uh, I think that's a hard thing to do. And without that, uh, I'm just afraid it's gonna it's gonna fade away because, you know, people that I think the real value in it is I can go to all my sites using this one persona. And if I can't, is it really worth then using it? I mean, if there's just one site that I want to go to that doesn't support it, is is it worth having? You know, does it really save me much then if if I still have to then manage all those other things separately? Well, another question uh, that I have is, say there is wide adoption and, you know, you can sign on using this method from everywhere. And we're talking about one password that gets you into every single site on the Internet. And, and that seems to me, especially without two-factor support, seems to me to be kind of, I don't, I don't know, is that, is, that, is that a good thing? I mean, it's easy for the user, but then... Then again, you have one password. If that's if somehow the the system gets broken and 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 or your somebody get, has a keylogger on your system, they basically have all your accounts all just right there at their fingertips. Well, that's a vulnerability, though. Um, I mean, you could say that it exists with LastPass. I, I know LastPass supports two-factor authentication, but it doesn't force it to be two-factor authentication so again that's one where you store all your accounts and if that if that password you use for LastPass gets broken then uh, you know all those accounts that you have under it can all be logged into so I mean and that's the thing they're that's facing true. as well that's true but I, on the, I, I mean I, I, I used it I signed up for an account and currently on the beta there is nothing that prevents <laughs> me from using a really stupid dumb uh, not strong password at all, which I did use a stupid, dumb, not strong password <laughs> just because I wanted to see if I could use it. And your and ID it, is uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, my ID has access to nothing, so so you know. Um, 
But anyway, but to contrast I mean, that, the last pass though, do they make you put a strong password? I, I don't. I don't remember now. Do I they think have they a warn you? Yeah, they, 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 warn, they tell you, you about the strength of it. They okay. warn you a lot, and if you put in a not strong <laughs> password, they will say this is a bad idea. But you can still do it, but they warn you multiple times not to do it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think um, software vulnerabilities will still always be the Achilles' heel here. And so Preston's point about having a two-factor identity uh, may reduce some of that risk. Not completely eliminate it, certainly, because you know once you're signed in, the software is still vulnerability, uh, still vulnerable to attack. Uh, once those credentials are there, even with two-factor. So, you know, is it a perfect world? No, but then nothing is. So. We're all looking. We're looking to ways to reduce risk for users, and and this is another way of doing it. The question is whether you know technologically it could be sound technology, um, but if nobody uses it, then it's not very not very useful to users, as we've already mentioned. So that will be the challenge, I think, for Mozilla in terms of getting this adopted. Well, and and with me using LastPass, a method to store all my passwords in one spot. Um, basically, and, and, and I had, you know, there's plugins for my browsers and things like that. There is no, there's nothing to gain from me using a single sign on system versus just having different passwords to different accounts on different sites. It gains me nothing because it doesn't, from my perspective, it's just as easy to use LastPass as it would be to use a single sign on system. And then I have a different password on every single site. So if one site gets broken into, then it's that site that's compromised and nothing else. The only thing I would gain is if it supported two-factor authentication. I could use two-factor authentication on sites that I normally couldn't. Yeah, but you're talking like a security professional, Preston. Yeah, you're not the, you're, you you're not the audience pass. for this. Yeah, you use LastPass, and you know to generate different passwords. I, you know, you can have a LastPass user that uses a total of three different passwords that are all weak for all their accounts, and they can keep them in LastPass with a strong password, um, which may not be offering that much more security. So I, I think that's. I mean, I think that's a very valid point. Security professionals probably won't adopt it, I'm thinking, or at least a large amount of them won't. They'll probably play around with the technology, but uh, I think this is trying to get at the average user who doesn't want the headaches, doesn't want to understand encryption and strong passwords. They just want a, a simple way to provide security. Um, and that's why I think the, you know, the number of sites that incorporate it's going to be the deal breaker for them. If they can't get a large number of sites to support it, then uh, no one has an incentive to use it. Absolutely. Well, I, I think from a user, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep going on on this topic. <laughs> from a user standpoint, um, should we be encouraging users to use to use a single a single sign-on system with a strong password, or should we be encouraging them to use a password management system and use multiple strong passwords on multiple sites? Well, I think you you know if you were a security leader in some organization, you'd have to address all the issues associated with either solution, figure out what the risk is, figure out the best way to approach it, and determine which is the right approach for that organization. You know, if cost were a factor, then having uh, LastPass may not be the right approach, but having uh, the persona system might. But if they don't have access to a lot of the sites that, you know, because Persona is not widely adopted, then that, that approach isn't going to work, and LastPass might make more sense. So there's, there's trade-offs to be made based on what the user population is and what risk we're dealing with. Because this system does also benefit uh, the websites who are using it as well, because they can kind of say, we're using this authentication system instead of storing our own passwords. We yeah. don't have to store any passwords. We can use this instead. Absolutely. So it, it benefits more than just the user. It benefits the user and the site using it. Right. And you could probably develop, develop a lot of internal apps in an organization that used the persona system and save a little cost there in development and, and security for those. So th there's trade-offs to be made, you know, whatever system it's used. They but I think adoption is going to be the big issue. Right, and I agree. And OpenID, 
you know, how 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 well adopted has that been, um, and, and and things like that. It's 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 going to be tough. I mean, and and the big sites, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, uh, they're not they're going to not use it unless unless its popularity b balloons to uh, unprecedented levels. Right. Right. Yeah, that's that's the key. But you know, at least Mo Mozilla is big enough to maybe make some waves there, and, and to to get in with some of those larger organizations. But um, you know, it'll just it'll just take time to see how how quickly it it, it gets adopted. Um, and like you said, without the without that second factor, you're not going to have security professionals maybe encouraging it as much as, as they would. Um, but you know, it's it's. It, I think it's still a, it could have a be a really good solution, but without two factor, I think uh, like you said, Preston, you're not going to go away from from LastPass because it doesn't do the two factor. Now, if it did, I'm assuming you'd probably be a little more interested in looking at it and seeing what you could do with it if it supported two factor. Well, yeah, if it, it would let me log into sites that I normally can't log into with two factor using two factor, then that might. You know, get me on board with it. Well, we'll have to see if they add that in a later release. Yeah, we'll see. And then with that, we'll. Uh, well, before we go, real quick, uh, Josh asked a question in the chat related to our first article. I thought we'd revisit that real quick before we end. Okay. And that was uh, so. For people that are concerned about others seeing their messages, will the DEA leak increase Android sales so users can use Orbot, which is basically Tor on Android, to protect their communications? Uh, my personal opinion is that uh, people buy Apple products because it's an Apple product. I don't think this the privacy of the device is of any concern to people who are Apple users. That's my personal opinion. Ouch. <laughs> Uh, well, and that's good branding. That's good marketing. There is good branding, and there is the whole. I, I know there's the whole Apple effect. Um, as you're using your MacBook there, Keith, I will say. <laughs> but um, I think that there's some truth to that. But I don't think that's necessarily entirely true. Um, I actually like the iOS setup. Um, I like the fact that it's closed source. I like that they how they do app approval. It doesn't mean no malicious apps get into the app store. When you look at Android, that's a it's, it's just a free for you know free form field. I mean, there's so many. It, you can have two Android phones that are so different versions apart, and, and even if they're the same version, it's dependent upon their carrier. There's no real consistency, so there's all these little gaps. There's all these little opportunities. Uh, so I would say that uh, privacy is important. Um, to iPhone users, uh, but that being said, they do have a very loyal fan base, and they'd have to do something really, really bad, I think, to get people to move away from it. Because kind of once, once you kind of get sucked into that, you know, and, and you're and you're using those devices, um, you're taking advantage of them. You you really feel like you want to stay connected with that unless something really bad happened. But but I think there's I do think they do some things very well. I think they've earned that reputation to a certain degree. That, <laughs> wow, boy. <laughs> well, if I if I were to guess, the people who are who would move over because of of this have already moved over. Um, That's probably to, true. And I don't know if there's a version of Tor for iPhone. I, I have a. I don't think the that. iOS system. I doubt it. Allow it to work. I doubt it, but uh, but you can use VPNs on an iPhone and things like that. But that still doesn't solve iMessage. You just have to use some other messaging system other than iMessage, which probably is supported on the iPhone. I'm guessing there's other messaging systems. Yeah, and you can. I mean, you know, there is the. There are folks out there that will jailbreak their iPhones, and they can then run all kinds of different things on them as well but I, I think he's right I don't think it's probably officially supported through the uh, the Apple store um, but I don't know I haven't I haven't looked into it um. all right well with that can, can I end it now Keith? yeah you can please all please right, quickly that, before we we'll, devolve into a religious war <laughs> all right and with that we'll end the podcast thanks to uh, Mike Hill, Keith Watson, and Josh Gillum. I'm Preston Wiley. Have a safe and secure day.